Hello friends, I'm Tex Mars, and I'm glad you're with us today. We're going to be examining something very odd. In fact, a lot of things that are odd and weird and, to keep going with such words, bizarre and strange. I've been a, uh, you might say, an interested uh, 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 student of the space program ever since its inception. Uh, and of course, that's been practically my, my whole life. I was born about the same time that the space program began uh, in 1944. Of course, we uh, in the United States brought Werner von Braun and the Nazi scientist over uh, under Operation Paperclip and uh, other secret uh, CIA OSS, it was called back then, operations, to found our own space program. They were indeed uh, German Nazi scientists. Since that day, since the day in 1945 that uh, Dr. Von Braun uh, entered the uh, soil of the continental United States and we began our space program, strange things have occurred with NASA, our space agency. Today we're going to look at some of these strange occurrences and happenings. The question might even be, and some may scoff at this notion, that the devil might be orchestrating the entire U.S. space program. We're going to look at that specifically. We're going to examine the faces on Mars, the hoax of the century it's been called. Did man really go to the moon? Pictures, strange photographs from the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and uh, from the astronauts even themselves in space. Monsters in the Eagle Nebula. Uh, we're going to look at Masonic magic and Illuministic activities. Are there magicians and occultists among the astronauts? I believe there are. How about spies in space? And then strange creatures spiders, bees, uh, crickets in space, dinosaurs on the moon, it may sound fantastic. We'll look at that as well. UFO sightings by NASA's astronauts and Russia's cosmonauts. Could it be that NASA has often sighted strange objects in space, UFOs, and they have not reported this to the American people. We will look at Satan worshiper, uh, rocket scientists and engineers. And we will ask ourselves, are there in fact Satanists among NASA's elite today? And are there high level Freemasons among uh, the astronauts and the executives who run our space program today? So let's get right to work here. And we've got so much to cover today. I hope I can get through all of these things with you. First of all, we have to understand that NASA and the space program is a top secret, in many ways, government program, a military program, if you will. Many of them, of course, are uh, part of the National Security Agency's uh, experiments in space. In my newsletter, which was previously called Flashpoint, but now as Power Prophecy, I exposed the National Security Agency. I did so in my book, by the way, Project Lucid, Project Lucid, L-U-C-I-D. But here was very interesting. I made a study of the National Security Agency's logo, their emblem, their symbol. And from their own literature, they state that, of course, they have the eagle at the very center of their logo. But they say something interesting in their own brochure, they state, quote, this is from Nash, uh, the National Security Agency now, the key and the eagle's talons, or in its grip, representing the key to security, evolves from the emblem of St. Peter the Apostle and his powers to loose and to bind. Do they have godly powers at the National Security Agency and therefore uh, at NASA, one of its subordinate programs? What we do know is that the ability to spy on human beings has been much updated, let's just say, by 
NASA's experimentation and much of its high technology and science. Here, for example, is an article in Popular Mechanics saying that NASA's spacecraft will get smaller and smaller. Well, interestingly enough, they say that they can actually put a spacecraft of sorts on the wings of a butterfly. Quite, uh, quite interesting, isn't it? Now, let's move very quickly to the satanic aspect of NASA. First of all, we go to the Bible because I believe strongly in Bible prophecy. Did you know that Jesus depicted Lucifer or Satan as a creature that comes from the skies, comes from the heavens? Yes. Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, I beheld Lucifer like lightning fall from heaven. He was like a bolt of lightning falling from heaven. That's what Jesus said. The Apostle Paul said that Lucifer or Satan, the devil or the old dragon, if you will, said that he comes as an angel of light and he said that he is prince of the power of the air. Prince of the power of the air. He comes from the heavenlies. He's even depicted as a star. Satanists such as Aleister Crowley who call himself the B666 six and that's three sixes and uh, Great Britain actually said that every man is a star, a star God. Listen to what Isaiah in the book of Isaiah in the Bible and uh, this is so very vital for us to understand. It talks about Lucifer. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? O Lucifer, how art thou fallen from heaven? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The boast of Satan, he will ascend into the heaven and conquer even space itself. Wow. Is that the reason NASA and the United States of America and even Russia has sought conquest in space? Are we doing Satan's work? Well, I want you to understand that in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, it also says something about the final destiny of Isaiah. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> not of Isaiah, but of Lucifer. It says, and here is the prophecy, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. He'll be brought down to hell. He is not going to ascend unto the stars. And to confirm that, we read Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 16. Listen to this, my friends. It says, though thou shouldest make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence. You can fly like an eagle, NASA or Lucifer, but God will bring you down no matter how high, no matter how far up you put your nest. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6, verses 11 through 12. He advises us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world. And then listen to this. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Now you may ask me, well, what? I still don't understand how the space program is connected with Satanism, with the occult. Well, first of all, Let's move to the, one of the pioneers of the space program, a man named Jack Parsons. John Carter and Robert, with an introduction by Robert Anton Wilson, put out a book not too long ago entitled Sex and Rockets, The Occult World of Jack Parsons. But who was Jack Parsons? My friends, this is probably the greatest scientist in the history of the world's space programs, including NASA. Jack Parsons. Some say that the Jet Propulsion Laboratories in Pasadena, California were named after him. Jack Parsons, he was considered a, a genius. And of course, he gathered with him other scientists just as, as brilliant as he. Today, you will see there in uh, uh, 
at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is one of the founding laboratories of our space program, there is this monument which celebrates the birthday of the JPL of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And it notes that the JPL Laboratory was uh, erected, began its operations in ha on Halloween. <laughs> That's the day when the, you know, the dead uh, come forth, it said. Halloween, 1968. By the way, you'll notice one of the names on this monument, in addition to Jack or John W. Parsons, they just call him Jack, but his official name was John W. Parsons. One of the names is William C. Rockefeller. I think it's interesting to have a Rockefeller name there, too, as one of the pioneers of America's space program. Here's, some, uh, uh, here's a picture of John or Jack Parsons with some of his work. This was June 4th, 1943. Then we have also this uh, a picture of Jack Parsons as he sits candlelit and he begins a satanic ritual. You see, Jack Parsons, this great scientist and rocket engineer, was in fact a member of the OTO, a satanic sect. He was the head of the American branch of this sect. And here we see uh, a woman who he frequently had ritual uh, uh, sex with. In fact, they carried on, he uh, and uh, uh, this woman carried on sexual relations and they, uh, under this ritual, to invoke the coming of the Antichrist. The coming of the Antichrist. All right? To be born, the baby who would be the Antichrist. They had a ritual, they called it Babylon working, that they conducted to accomplish this. How did Parsons learn about Satanism and Satan worship, and how did he become a member of the OTO? He became connected with this man, Aleister Crowley. Parsons actually called him Father. Notice that Crowley love to call himself the beast 666 is shown here with not only a satanic pentacle on this book but the satanic triangle on his head and he is making the sign of Pan the horned god of the forest. Here is the parsonage you might say or the house on 1003 South Orange Grove Street in Pasadena, California it no longer stands today. But at the time this picture was made, this house was used for a number of satanic rituals by Mr. Parsons and was the headquarters of the OTO. Here's some photographs I'd like you to see of uh, Aleister Crowley as he conducts a ritual. Here are his laws. He put out the laws of Satan, the commandments. We have our Ten Commandments. The Church of Satan has their, uh, its commandments, and these are the laws that uh, uh, Mr. Crowley and uh, Parsons, this rocket scientist, developed. Now we'll see even some more pictures of Crowley and the witchcraft sect and some of the artwork that, that uh, hung in... Uh, some of the uh, temples of worship of these people. And notice, if you will, uh, although this is not Jack Parsons' uh, initiation certificate, you might say, or uh, th this piece of parchment, it is, in fact, a legitimate certificate showing membership in the lodge of the OTO, the occult lodge, of one of its members. It's interesting that the Bible talks about the serpent's root is a fiery flying serpent. You can read about that in Isaiah 14, a fiery serpent. Werner von Braun, the, the uh, former Nazi rocket scientist who came to the United States and headed up our space program for a while, was our chief scientist, 
had a, uh, said something very odd. I'd like to quote him if I could. Way back in 1959, he said, We find ourselves faced by powers which are far stronger than we had hitherto assumed and whose base of operations is at present unknown to us. The American space program was faced by powers, these strong powers, whose base of operations was unknown even to the chief scientist of NASA. Was he talking about demons from some uh, uh, installation in space? Very odd. If, if we look at the history of NASA, we can see a lot of the Masonic and occult implications. Here's a book, for example, and a movie was made of this starring you know, Academy Award winning uh, actor Tom Hanks. Apollo 13, the Apollo 13 flight. Remember they made famous the saying, Houston, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Started to Tom Hanks, Kevin Bacon, Ed Harris, and others. It's very interesting. When you uh, look at this book, first of all, you see a very odd pagan or occultic symbol. This was the official Apollo 13 emblem here that I'm showing you. What if that has any relationship to Revelation 6 in the Bible talks about the white horse of the apocalypse. The white horse of the apocalypse. Then we go on and it talks about the perilous voyage of Apollo 13. Because disaster almost struck in space, as you know, and it, was, it appeared that the flight was going to be lost with all the astronauts aboard. Some say, of course, this was simply an occult ritual. Now, I'd like to bring to your attention here uh, in this uh, book, which is, by the way, uh, by Jim Lavelle, the astronaut. So it's by an astronaut. It's, it's basically uh, sort of a semi-official record of this flight. Here it shows the actual spacecraft being launched. I'd like to read to you what the caption says. It says Apollo 13, and by the way, the number 13 is that supernatural number of witchcraft, of witchcraft, but maybe that's just coincidence. Apollo, of course, is a name of the pagan sun god, the sun, the, the sun S-O-N, of the sun god Zeus, was Apollo in the pagan mythologies. Perhaps that, of course, is just a coincidence. In the book of, book of Revelation, the dark angel who has the key to the bottomless pit and opens it up, and locusts come forth. It seems like these, these fiery, flying creatures from the heavens or from somewhere in the bottomless pit begin to torment people and sting people. It says that their leader is named Apollyon. Apollo, or Apollyon, interestingly. But yet we have all of our space flights named by uh, or after these mythological creatures, gods and deities and so forth. But let me just read you the caption on this uh, picture. It says, Apollo 13 lifted off on April 11th, 1970 at 1.13 p.m. Houston time or 13.13 military time. It says, a numerologically inauspicious start. Oh, really? Apollo 13 takes off at exactly military time 1313. 13. Three 13s. That's the triple witching hour. Now, in this book, Freemasonry in American History by Alan Roberts is a record of our uh, space program and the Masonic participation in it. From John Glenn to Buzz Aldrin on and on and on. It seems the majority of our astronauts are Freemasons of the secretive Masonic lodges. Isn't that fascinating? Wish I had time to tell you the names of all of these, but you can see I have it marked to the chapter. And by the way, it's interesting. The chapter is called Eyes in the Sky. It's chapter 33 that talks a lot about Freemasonry in the space program. And of course, 33 is the highest initiation ritual 
uh, of Freemasonry. I'm sure all of that is simply a coincidence as well. In this book that was put out by Time Life, Ancient Wisdom and Secret Sex, and this is put out by Time Life Books some years ago, is a very interesting item in here about what else? Well, about the U.S. space program. It notes that in looking at secret societies uh, and Masonic groups, that a number of the Masons, of course, were indeed members of the Masonic Lodge. But then it's revealed this interesting tidbit. It seems that astronaut Edwin uh, Buzz Aldrin, remember now, he was part of the crew that was the very first to sit down on the moon, we are told. Buzz Aldrin, remember Neil Armstrong and so forth. They landed on the moon, or did they? But in any case, as this, article, as this book uh, uh, denotes, astronaut Buzz Aldrin, a 33rd degree Mason, took with him this strange pennant. Now, this was never in the press. Dan Rather, Walter Cronkite, and all the news people didn't tell you about it. But here, this strange pennant or flag, Supreme Council, 33rd degree, Southern Jurisdiction of Freemasonry, the double-headed eagle. And this flag was placed on the moon, and they actually claimed the moon for Freemasonry. Did you know that? It was our taxpayer dollars that bought uh, 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 paid for the spacecraft and this mission. But when they got there, they claimed it was the territory now of Freemasonry. I think that's very odd. In fact, as, as incredible as this may seem, and here we have Leviathan in space and all its glory, here in the March 2000 edition of the Scottish Rite Journal, this is the number one Masonic publication in the world, it says that a lodge, a Masonic lodge, has been established on the moon. And this was in the uh, summer of 19, uh, uh, let's see, let me make sure I get this uh, right for you here, my friends. Talks about two Ameri the astronauts who landed, two American astronauts. One of them, it says, was Edwin Eugene Buzz Aldrin, 33rd degree, a member of Clear Lake Masonic Lodge number 1417. But now they have chartered in the year 2000 Masonic Lodge number 2000 in the Sea of Tranquility. And it says that Buzz Alwyn, as a spe special deputy of the Grand Master of Freemasonry, has been granted full power to claim Masonic territorial jurisdiction on the moon, and that was done during that flight. But now, you can, if you join the Freemasons, you can become a member of Lodge 2000, which is a Masonic Lodge on the moon. Do they go up there in spirit? Now we understand, and by the way, this is a picture out of a uh, news magazine quoting astronaut Neil Armstrong. Remember that? Supposedly when the, their uh, lander set foot on the moon, it was announced to the whole world back in 1969, Houston, tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Why did they name it Eagle? Was it not after the double eagle? Did anybody know that in addition to the American flag, they would first, of course, plant the flag of Freemasonry, the double-headed eagle, and that even their lander would be named the Eagle, and it would be announced, in other words, that the Masonic Eagle has landed. And now at that same base where the moonshot was, the Tranquility Base, they say they have a Masonic Lodge there. They own the place. Very, very strange and bizarre, is it not? Now, one of the uh, interesting aspects of our space program, my friends, is uh, that we continue to be inundated with photographs and pictures from space. Some of these are, are quite odd and uh, weird to the extreme. We're going to look at some of these. Scientists say they've been able to find a, a treasure a trove of information from uh, these uh, different of the Hubble uh, Space Telescope, and of course, even the astronomers here on, on Earth-based telescopes. But it's, it's fascinating. For example, in this uh, uh, huge uh, uh, newspaper item that's really across the United States, Associated Press and others carried it, 
William Cochran, a University of Texas astronomer, said, it's a revolution. We have a lot of really valuable new data that has allowed us to rethink a lot of things, unveiling the heavens. Here's a picture, by the way, of the uh, Chandra X-ray Observatory. Quite a, a stunning picture, is it not? By the way, way the uh, Chandra X-ray Observatory, Chandra uh, is a word meaning star. Some people point out the preposterous but interesting thought that Chandra Levy, the intern for Congressman Condit in Washington, D.C., her name was Chandra, which of course meant star, a star. Some say she was a victim of a satanic sacrifice there in Washington, uh, D.C., and it was the sacrifice of the star goddess. Now, here we see an explosion that supposedly dazzles scientists from space. This, this orbiting Chandra X-ray telescope sent back this fantastic image in space. Here's an interesting one. This is from the European magazine of all places. And this is, again, from, this is Jupiter's satellite, EO, and a picture of it. And it says it looks like a huge planet pizza piping hot. Let me try to get that straightened out a little bit for you. And you know, it does look sort of like a huge plate of pizza, does it not? Would you like large, medium, or small today, sir? Well, in any case, here was a picture that came out of the Hubble Space Telescope. And I first looked at it, and the caption doesn't say anything about it, but I kept looking at this and looking at this, and, well, it just seemed to me there was the face of a beast. Is that not the face of a beast? Do you not make out the chin and the lips and the nose and the eyes and the head? Isn't that a strange creature in space that has been sighted? You wonder about Lucifer being the star who fell from heaven. Maybe this is some other kind of a beast that's been observed uh, in the heavens. Is that too far out? Here's from the Space Telescope, and even National Geographic was stunned, so stunned that this became the front cover of the National Geographic magazine. This is a, an actual photograph from Hubble's Eye on the Universe, says National Geographic. Imagine that we've heard about the all-seeing eye on our $1 bill. Is this the all-seeing eye in space? of Lucifer? Is he looking down us, the prince of the power of the air? Could it be? Very odd indeed. Here's some more pictures. This is from a uh, very popular uh, uh, astronomical type magazine. Are these creatures from space standing on pedestals, staring down at us? Nightmarish creatures in the sky? It does seem too far-fetched, does it not? And then there are these strange experiments and the strange happenings in space. For example, here's a children's book of all things. It's called Spinning in Space. And it talks in this book about, well, the, let me just show it to you if I might. Although this is for kids, it says that one of the experiments in space, the astronauts took spiders on board to see if they would spin their little uh, webs. Here's an artist's conception of what occurred from the Skylab project. Here's the hatching of thousands of eggs by the spider, NASA says. Quite fascinating. And then here are the spiders and some of their webs. I have no idea what earthly good spiders in space would have. Then some years ago, they say that Israeli scientists participated in a NASA project, and they, they contributed by having a colony of bees. Well, here are some bees here. This is probably much what 
the colony of bees in space that the astronauts brought up. Bees in space producing honey. Well, you know, the Old Testament tells the Jews to never but never bring honey into the tabernacle. It's interesting, the queen bee of Babylon is much worshipped by pagans. Well, here is one of the popes. Yes, one of the popes. In fact, the caption here says Urban the Eighth. And there is his great symbol, an unholy trinity of three bees. Very odd. You see that, by the way, that same symbol at the Vatican, at St. Peter's at the Vatican. Now, <clears throat> if we really want to get into the theater of the weird, all you have to do is go into NASA's Internet webpage. You'll find in their shuttle mission archi archives the story of Shuttle mission number 58 on the Columbia, which, by the way, is a, uh, 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 the name of the great goddess Columbia. Here again we have one of the pagan goddesses. Mission STS-58 on Columbia. Here's a picture of the astronauts. If you can see, this is black and white, and I'm going to show it to you in just a moment. This is all about it. I have a whole packet of information obtained from the Internet. And interesting, here's a list of the crew, and I want to show you, by the way, John Blaha, of all, that's a sort of a strange name, John Blaha was the commander, I'm going to show you here this picture of the crew, and I want you to notice this gentleman right here, let me put my little hand here, see this man here, his name is Marvin Fetman, he was on this crew. He was the first veterinarian, that's animal doctor, in space. The first animal doctor or veterinarian in space. There's the full crew of STS-58. Now, in addition to these human astronauts, they also brought on board a huge number, at least 48 rats. Yes, that's right, R-A-T-S, rats. Rats in space. You read all about it, of course, as I said on the NASA Internet page. Now, <clears throat> in my newsletter, I reported. Now, the most astonishing thing about this whole thing, by the way, this, the first article is at the top here. I reported it says, this is back way in March of 1994, rats beheaded in space. Did you know that it, according to the reports, if they were true, and I assume they were, Dr. Uh, Martin Fetman, America's, fir uh, America's first veterinary in space, had the dubious honor of having to slay or to kill a number of these mice and rats and dissect their bodies in space. And what did he use to do this? A miniature guillotine. He took a guillotine, a little tiny guillotine, and cut off the heads of the rats. That's how they killed the rats, by guillotine. Now, I know during the French Revolution, Marie Antoinette and King Louis lost their head, but who would have ever known that NASA would be beheading rats with a guillotine in a spacecraft? It sounds like an odd thing to me. Some, of course, being very suspicious, might point to Revelation 20, verse 4. It says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus in the last days. The saints of God are beheaded. Here we have rats. Well, certainly that's not the saints of God. That's not Christians. But interestingly, at this very same time, and here is the second article, Universal Press Syndicate ran this cartoon across America. It showed a bunch of rats dragging the GOP, that's the Republican elephant, into a fundamentalist Christian mission where he didn't want to go. The Republican Party doesn't want to go anywhere with these Christian fundamentalist rats. He says, geez, what on earth is happening to me? Now, friends, I think this is pretty much bashing, sort of a hate crime against Christians, a hatred toward fundamental Christians, but depicting Bible-believing Christians as rats. And at the same time, up in space, NASA and its Martin Fetman, Dr. Fetman, America's first veterinarian in space, are beheading rats in space. 
By the way, just as a little kink on this, this is just odd coincidence, but notice the third article I've got on this page three of my newsletter back in March of 1994. Abortion Dr. Wells shotgun against Christians. It seems that in Austin, Texas, this 46-year-old medical doctor who was an abortionist didn't like people uh, demonstrating in front of his home, and so he took a shotgun to them. They are uh, very loving people, as you can uh, see. By the way, here's actually the article from my newsletter in, uh, uh, with black and white and red color and such, these articles that I just told you about. Now, one of the things that has been very interesting in space, according to this video, and we have just a little clip from it, but I want to give credit to the right video. It's called The Secret NASA tr uh, Transmissions, The Smoking Gun. Talks about a gentleman over in the area of Great Britain in Scotland who evidently, accidentally, because he has a, he's manager of a cable TV station, was able to plug in and bring down NASA transmissions of, of a number of space shots. And he says that there are UFOs that are being sighted all the time by NASA, but they do not report it to the general public. UFOs, now you take a look, my friend, at these strange white circular light objects buzzing around various spacecraft. Even the astronauts have noted it, and this gentleman has tape recorded a number of the conversations of the astronauts. Are these UFOs in space? Some would say, but they're tiny little circular lights. Whatever they are, they're very small as they dart around. But does that make them illegitimate? I mean, we could have a 500-foot-tall UFO alien as well as we could have a Tiny, tiny, tiny <laughs> alien in a teeny, tiny little UFO. Who knows? By the way, this gentleman wrote a book, Fred Steckling. You may believe it or believe it not. I choose actually not to believe it. But he said, we discovered alien bases on the moon. That's what this book says. But NASA and the astronauts refused to tell us about it. Alien bases on the moon. He says the Blow-ups of photographs released by NASA prove there are alien or extraterrestrial bases on the moon. But there are people who say we never went to the moon. So that would make that, of course, impossible. Here's an article that came out in Reader's Digest some years ago. Does the moon make us mad, it says. Did you know that Vladimir Lenin in his last days, the founder of communism, would go out onto his balcony and howl at the moon? I have a, a file of Democratic Party politicians in the Austin, Texas area, including a picture of Liz Carpenter, who was the press secretary to First Lady, uh, uh, Lady Bird Johnson, who regularly goes out on full moons in and, and the hill country of Texas and howls at the moon. Maybe the moon does make us mad. Maybe our astronauts of NASA have been driven mad by their efforts to go to the moon. Who knows? Now, a man named Richard Hoagland came upon some photographs of NASA some years ago, and he said, does this not look like, this is, by the way, of the, I think it was the Viking uh, probe, and back in 1976, NASA actually filmed this strange picture. This was the Mars Surveyor, it says. Later on, the Mars Surveyor was going to scrutinize this, these strange pictures. Is this some kind of a monument on the moon, a ruin of a monument? Is that a man's face? Well, scientist Richard Hoagland said he thought it was. Now, I've studied a lot about this, and it's uh, uh, all kinds of articles. I wish I had the time to talk about these. By the way, to give credit to Mr. Hoagland, he put out a book called The Monuments of Mars. Richard Hoagland by North Atlantic Books out of Berkeley, uh, California. Now, I want to just mention that that later on, NASA uh, put out some, addition, some, some supplemental photographs years later, which the, the same effects do not appear. And NASA says this was just the lighting, just the lighting of uh, that particular uh, mission shot. So was it just a lighting problem, or were, was that really a face on the moon? Well, 
Not too long ago, NASA announced that they had found what appeared to be a rock from Mars, yes, from the planet Mars, that had life on it. A fossil was found. Wow. Some worm-like fossil, they said, from Mars. Shocked the whole world. There is life in outer space. Bacteria, life, and maybe more. That's what they said in this article. Now, I, I have this from a tabloid. It's very interesting. Dick Morris, who was the top White House advisor, political advisor to President Bill Clinton at the time, the Mars rock showing there might be life on Mars was found. And uh, this is very interesting. This is a call girl up here, if you'll see in, her, in this picture. And it just so happened that when Clinton talked to his chief political advisor, Mr. Morris, and gave him the news, Mr. Morris was, well, he was having a tea to teat with his girlfriend there in the hotel. Sherry Rollins was her name. And it says that while Clinton was on the phone to Morris telling him about the military secret that only seven people in the world knew about at the time, the discovery of life on Mars, Morris was there in the hotel room and he turned to her and said, well, now you're the eighth. She was the eighth person to know a call girl or hooker connected with the Clinton administration. Well, it didn't work out. Scientists started looking it over and saying NASA's all wet, that this was all propaganda. Uh, New rules of science, says this one article. Uh, people said no. Hype on Mars, was how this article put it. Hype on Mars, says it's pure baloney. The fossil was not real, and there was no life found on Mars. Uh, but it did stir up a lot of interest. Look at this. From Newsweek, mission to Mars. Uh, we need to go there, the red planet. There could be life. Mission to Mars. Newsweek came out. And then Time, not to be beat, said, Is there anybody out there? Big feature article. They say these magazines sold a lot. Then there was, of course, items like this. Questioning coming out. Could there be aliens? Could there be extraterrestrials? After all, if NASA did find life on Mars, could there be life like this? Very interesting. Well, in any case, this book came out even before we supposedly found life on Mars or didn't find it according to what you find. This is a book called The Birth of the Moon. The Birth of the Moon. And in it, this scientist, Lewis Manson, says that the moon actually once was part of Earth. And a, a great catastrophe or calamity occurred and a piece of the earth broke off and then was captured by gravity and became our moon, our present moon. And he got some photos of, uh, from NASA and began to look at them to see if he could find, if that were true, then the great beast and prehistoric creatures that, that once roamed the earth w would be on the moon, would they not? After all, if they were here and then a big chunk of the earth uh, flew off into space, was hurled into space, was captured by gravity and became our moon, then there might be fossil evidence that these creatures from the planet Earth were up in the moon. Well, look at this. First life discovered on the moon, said Mr. Manson way back in 1966. Now this rock formation, he said, appears to be the petrified head of the Critosaurus. Could it be? Friends, you decide. There it is. Is that indeed the head of the Critosaurus? Take a look and see for yourself. It does look very suspicious. Is that the Critosaurus? This rock formation was found on the moon. And then here we have on the other side from a NASA photograph that Mr. Manson looked at very carefully. He says this looks like a giant squid, this fossil. Here is a picture, of course, of the squid on Earth, and there is the fossil evidence, he says. Could it be? Is that, in fact, evidence 
of life that once existed <laughs> on the moon. By the way, a lot of people wonder about my interest in this, and I did a whole uh, audio tape investigative report on this cosmic collision, by the way, supposedly, and the, uh, the birth of the moon to see if that might be so. I've always been interested in these things. As you know, I'm a former Air Force officer, spent 20 years in the Air Force, and uh, for five years I was at the University of Texas teaching all about new weapon systems, including missiles. And one of the subjects that I taught uh, uh, to uh, students there at the University of Texas was the history of airspace, aerospace, and aviation. The history of the uh, Air Force and of aviation and uh, aerospace. So I have a special interest in these kinds of topics. We've talked about everything from witchcraft and uh, Masonic rituals uh, in space to the faces of a beast uh, in the uh, uh, Eagle Nebula. And by the way, that's interesting, isn't it? Some of those shots from the Hubble telescope uh, were uh, uh, photographs of the Eagle Nebula. We get back to the old Eagle of Freemasonry, don't we? Now we're going to go to a more serious topic, though, if those weren't serious enough for you. It has to do with astronaut murders. Astronaut murders. Some astronauts have been killed three specifically on one flight, and then you'll remember the Challenger flight. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But one of the Apollo flights, Gus uh, Griffin, Mr. White, and others were killed. And there have been some very, very strange accusations, or maybe they're not strange at all. For example, uh, Gus Grissom, he was one of the top astronauts in the American space program. Gus Grissom's son made this accusation my astronaut dad, he said, was murdered, was murdered. My astronaut dad was murdered. Here's a picture of Gus Grissom, very handsome man, and by the way, they named an air base after him, Grissom Air Force Base, after this tragic death. Three astronauts in this Apollo craft actually never took off because they were incinerated. They were burned alive. Here's a picture of the spacecraft. NASA still has kept that over the years. Exploded on the launch pad. And these three were burned alive, we are told. Although NASA changed its story several times, it seems exactly as to how they died. But Gus Grissom's son, according to this article, says that he thinks NASA is responsible for their murder. This is from Great Britain, of all places, Focus Magazine, one of their uh, top uh, sort of investigative news magazines, looked into space conspiracy, the NASA cover-up that killed three astronauts. And a, an incredible article in here. Apollo 11, NASA's dirtiest secret. Could it be? Here are the three astronauts on a dress rehearsal for the flight. And then we go on to these shots inside. And here again, we see these, the same picture, if you will, of the charred remains of the capsule of this Apollo ill-fated non-flight. From the Free Press, Kerrville, Texas, this item says, Retired NASA engineer reveals Apollo death's cause was a cover-up. A cover-up. Very interesting, isn't it? Well, then we get to the Challenger. Here's some from uh, sort of a uh, looking back edition of newspapers. It says the Challenger, Challenger 7 explodes in, and, and actually it wasn't even up in space. It was up in the sky and had only been launched a short time before and it blew up and all of the astronauts, including that woman astronaut, was killed. There are some who say this could have been an occult ritual. In fact, I've done a whole video called The Eagle Has Landed that discusses that very 
crazy, but, well, is it a possibility? Some would say, you're paranoid to think such things. I say, study, investigate, and then decide for yourself. Here is another edition of our own local newspaper talking about the Challenger uh, accident. The very name Challenger, was it a Challenger to Lucifer? Was this some kind of strange occult ritual? And there's the crew, all of them, dead. But of course, that wasn't the first thing, uh, bad thing to happen to NASA. Here from Final Frontier Magazine is this feature story, $80 billion blunder. Then in USA Today, here is a list that says past space accidents. Whole list of them. Past space accidents. The date and the incident that occurred. Sounds sinister. Then as far as the overall Star Wars or space program, Great Britain of course has been working with us on this. Isn't it interesting? This newspaper item they hit the Associated Press of the United States. Baffling case of 10 dead scientists. One after another, scientists working on the Star Wars program were found dead. Most of mysterious causes over in Great Britain. We move from the potential murder of astronauts, could it be, to the hoaxes. Some people say that the whole moonshot landing was a hoax. We never went to the moon. We're going to look at, at that in just a moment here. Let's just look at some of the books that have come out on this subject. Moongate. Really? We never went to the moon. Here's another book. A very thick book. Powerful book. Dark Moon. People are blowing the whistle now, they say. Here, a good friend of mine, Rene, published this book. Self-educated engineer, a brilliant man, NASA mooned America. This entire book shows that technologically and engineering-wise, we could not possibly have landed on the moon in 1969 as we stated we did. And by the way, this very picture supposedly proves that. There were two astronauts who supposedly landed on the moon, who actually walked on the moon. We've talked about that a little bit earlier. Buzz Aldrin, 33rd degree, and Neil Armstrong. But look at this picture. Notice that in the visor, in the, uh, the, the, the head piece of this astronaut, is the other astronaut across the way. He has no camera in his hand. Who took the picture? Some people believe, in fact, there was an entire movie that was created by Hollywood called Capricorn One. It starred, of all people, O.J. Simpson, the murderer. <laughs> Most people think he was a murderer. O.J. Simpson, the great football star who was tried but found, <clears throat> excuse me, let me clear my throat if you know what I mean, innocent of killing his wife and a young man. Started in the movie Capricorn One. And this movie proposed that a, a actual movie set had been set up in a huge uh, aircraft hangar or some building of some sort out in the desert in a rough area. And they filmed the whole thing. They created it all on film. And that's why the images are so grainy and everything. They didn't, didn't want you to see all the detail and such of that flight. By the way, Renee had these pictures, and this has been in a number of magazines and newspapers. This was in the spotlight some years ago. Let's look at these in sequence. Here we have the first picture. It's an astronaut. And according to NASA, this is an astronaut who's, who's rehearsing for a space shot. He's rehearsing. He's in a capsule, and he's just rehearsing for a space shot. Then the next picture actually shows an astronaut in space. But look very carefully. You'll see that this is the same picture, the same astronaut in every way. He's simply reversed. 
or reverse out, as you can do with negatives. Look at these. You see the same thing here. On one side, you see the astronaut, and you see he's inside their a trailer or their cabin, whatever it is that they do their rehearsals and their training mission. And in the other, they say he's actually walking in space. This was a photograph. The astronaut is supposedly actually walking in space. You know what they did? They just dropped the background. It's the same photograph. <laughs> exactly. One back here on Earth while they were rehearsing, the other supposedly in space, but it's the same photograph. A little bit monkeying, would you not say? with reality. Here's an item in a magazine media bypass. Was it only a paper moon? Well, NASA put out this information. It was put in the U.S. News and World Report. It said, yes, we did go on the moon. Here's a picture. And guess what? This astronaut here on the moon is giving a Masonic sign, apparently, with his arm. Sign of a Master Mason. Very interesting. Probably, by the way, by the, the, probably the best known refuter and uh, the guy that wrote the, the, the best known book says we never went to the moon was a man named Bill Casing. I would like to give him credit for his work. We've covered a lot of strange things. Maybe we'll end with this quote. This quote from Abraham Lincoln. He once said, you may fool all of the people some of the time. You can even fool some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. Well, my friends, a century later, movie producer Joseph Levine summed up a new reality. He stated, you can fool all of the people all of the time if the advertising is right and the budget is big enough. Maybe that's what we've really been seeing in all of this witchcraft and the illusion and the pageantry of the space program. But, of course, there is a real, my friends. There are many counterfeits here. We really can't trust man here on Earth. We should not lean on man, but there's one you can lean on. And when we look past the oddities and the strange things and the weirdness and uh, all of the stagecraft of mankind, we can point to the reality of God. He does exist. He is Lord, and he's Lord of the entire universe, including this planet and all the stars you see in the sky. This has been Tex Mars. May God richly bless you.